There we go. You know what it means. You hear that music? You see this puppy? And you see this turkey? It means we're up for a Thanksgiving edition of Puppy Noir, the hardest hitting, gal loving, gat shooting, firing uh, book talk show on the internet, on the interweb. And that in the background is the, the Blues Brothers band, right? Because I, I don't know how long I can play before they start to sue me. I'm going to turn it off pretty quick. And this is Lucky the Wonder Dog. She's a hard eyed gal from the wrong side of the tracks. She liked her men like she liked her chew toys full of stuffing. And I'm going to have to let her go because this is the second time I've done it. Okay, Lucky, say goodbye to everybody. See you in the puppy noir. You're, you're a puppy part of the puppy part of the puppy noir is all over. Okay, Lucky. So that was the special effects. So this is, we have puppies. It's Thanksgiving. And we have puppies. We have turkey. You saw the turkey and the puppy part. We also have, because it's going to be a special bonus edition, we also have our special trophy from, from Prop Department because this is not only is this Puppy Noir, it's also the All Bathtub Hall of Fame. And that's why we brought out, brought out the special drink we only use for every episode, which is our, our cocktail glass with the biggest Manhattan I could make for thank, our Thanksgiving special. Um, today we're going to talk about something we've talked probably the most common, most often talked about writer on my program is George Simenon. For those of you who are sick of hearing me talk about George Simenon, you can go back to your turkeys, your, your own puppies. You don't have to talk to me anymore. But um, as far as uh, noir action and uh, what do you call it, the All Bathtub Hall of Fame. I'm certain I've spent as much time in the bathtub with Simonon as I have with any other writer. So what we've been doing the past uh, several years has been re reading through the entire May Gray series. And for, for, the for the holidays, since we didn't have to work, I didn't have any deadlines, you know, I've been reading one of these like every, every day and a half. It takes, about, it takes like two hours to read a May Gray. Read it properly. And... The ones I've just read were May Gray and the Man of the Bench, May Gray Goes to School, and May Gray and the Dead Girl. I I probably read at least two of these. I'm pretty sure I read in the past 50 years of reading Simonons. And this new these are all new translations from Penguin. They're really good translations. They have that kind of very simple, spare, uh, uh, hard style of, of Simonon. It's not tough guy style at all. It's very contemplative. It's very observant. It's, um, it's, not, uh, it's not that uh, clever, ornate prose you might get out of Chandler or Hammett. It's, it's much more in, uh, discreet than that. Anyway, I, I loved all of them. I, I think the 50s, these are from the 50s when, when, when Simonon wrote them all. And I thought I'd get, I, I think these are probably the best of them. I think the early ones, I think he didn't quite know what he was doing. He tries to write mysteries. He tries to make, uh, there's more gangsters and shootings and stuff like that. And the great ones are these, which is um, basically, uh, again, it's just uh, May Gray wandering around looking at people. And the one here was May Gray and the Man on the Bench. I, I really like this one. It's sort of a good exa example. It's about a guy who, the man who's murdered, they find this guy in, in the middle of Paris. And he lives with his wife in the suburbs. And he's worked for like a warehouse all his life. The man who's dead, and when they find him, they should they take the wife out to show him the dead body, and she says something that's you know there's something wrong here. I mean that someone's done something to my husband. And they say why? Because he's wearing he's wearing yellow shoes. He's got he, he he's wearing really fancy shoes, and he used to go home every night wearing boring clothes. And he was a really nondescript man. Everyone liked him. He was really nice to people. I forget what the guy's name was now it was Louis or something like that. And it turns out this guy quit his job, or he lost his job, and he spent the past few years in Paris going into work every day because his wife would yell at him otherwise. And he goes into work every day, and as a result of several years of whatever he's doing in London, I mean in Paris, he gets murdered. And there's some lovely stuff in it. It's basically what the guy does, the man on the bench, he's, a, he's one of these people that in any big major city, you walk past and they sit on the, they're sitting on benches all the time talking to people. You see this a lot in Paris. 
and maybe less so in London, where people don't chat around benches as much. But in Paris, you really will see people who seem to be like locals in the neighborhood who just sit in these benches. And at one point, Maigret uh, is reflecting, and he says, on the car ride back to Paris, Maigret's mind drifted to matters of no consequence. When he had first arrived in the capital at the age of 20, what had troubled him the most was the constant ferment of the city, the hundreds of thousands of people milling around in search of something or other. And that's the, that is the Maigret of the great mid-period mid books, just people's desires and how they get them into trouble. At certain key points, this ferment was more perceptible than at others. In former days, what had struck, you might say, even romantically inspired him about this crowd in perpetual movement were those people who, discouraged, defeated, and resigned, had given up on life and been swept along by the flow. Since then, he had come to know them, and they were no longer the ones who made the biggest impression on him. Rather, those who did were on the rung above, the decent, honest, inconspicuous types who struggled day in, day out to stay afloat, or to foster the illusion, the belief, that they really existed, and that life was worth living. And that's sort of what this character Louis is like, is he spent his whole life doing boring jobs, trying to be a good husband, good father, and this child he loves. And basically, um, no one cares, none of his family treats him very well, and he finds himself cast adrift and wandering through London. And and the lovely part of the Simenon books is when Simenon goes to meet, learn about these people after they're dead and learning that what their schedules are and the people they sort of meet. That's one of my favorites. Maigret goes to school, sort of calls back to the early Maigrets where he's always traveling places. And he goes to a, a small town. Uh, Maigret himself is from a small town and he really hates small provincial French life where everybody knows each other and is very judgmental and really unpleasant and is always judging each other. The, the, the key phrase in all of, of Simenon is don't judge. He never judges. He tries to understand the characters. And I love this one, too. I think all of these are really good. He goes back and he gets to know these kids and some a woman who's been murdered, some big, really horrible, ugly, awful woman gets shot and sort of almost accidentally murdered. And he's, he sort of follows through this little village, getting these little microcosms a small village life is another thing that Simenon does so well. Finally, the Maigret and the Dead Girl. All of these mid-level, mid-period books are some of my favorites. He he finds a dead woman, young girl, 20, 22 years old, dressed up in, uh, in a kind of a nice outfit, I think she is. And she's sort of pretty, and he looks at her, and, and he wants to find out who she is. And, and finding out who the characters are is what Maigret does. He doesn't look at clues or sniff gunpowder or any of that stuff. He just basically goes around and finds out what this girl was like and what she wore and where she got her clothes from. And we, in the course of it, we learn this quite sad story of this, this young girl from, some, again, some horrible provincial town who's come to Paris to find something special. Um, very different. Um, I, you can certainly call him noir, and the French did lots of black and white noir versions of, of Simenon, but um, very little action, very little uh, gal loving, and very very few guns show up in the in the Maigrets. They're they're very different books, and I love them at holidays holiday time. So uh, after all, all bathtub Hall of Fame for sure. Um, it, it gets it gets an award, one of our prestigious all bathtub awards, and it also gets the great lucky intro, which is what I basically live for is to watch the lucky it, lucky listening to. Peter Gunn himself. Okay, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody, and we'll see you soon.